And I feel to teach on this a thought, the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that this uh, Bible study, maybe it will give us a unique or a fresh look at the experience we have with God, the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidence with speaking in other tongues. And I pray the the Bible study will maybe give us some greater insight, understanding, or even revelation about our experience with God when He fills us with that comfort, when He fills us with His uh, Spirit. And this is definitely not an exhaustive Bible study. You can never really exhaust the Word of God, but we're going to endeavor to to address the topic and hopefully highlight some things you've never thought of. And I would encourage you, this is a Bible study that you can take in part or you can take in its entirety and teach a Bible study to someone who's truly seeking to know God. And I pray that it will benefit not only the body of Christ, but beyond the church. I pray that it will reach somebody, and I believe it's a reverberation, too, of the voice of God, of what we've been hearing over the past several services in a unique way. This really is a reverberation of the voice of God, because you and I, we need the Holy Ghost to make it to heaven. And I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the move that just happened. It's prayer meetings like that that will keep you in the church. Oh, come on. But also will rapture you out of the church. This, this world is not my home. Praise. I'm going to try to teach, Bishop, but I feel the presence of God. I feel a preach in my spirit. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to endeavor to teach this. But so thankful for the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And really, God comforts us in so many ways. God, he comforts us through the wonderful promises of his word. And when we read the word of God, we see the promises of his word, and that can comfort us. We're also comforted through fellow believers. That's why I believe it's so important that we come together. We assemble together in worship. And there's something powerful about worshiping together, singing together. We just experience praying together. There's something powerful about coming together and the unity of that. I believe the comfort of the Holy Ghost is released. But God, again, comforts us in so many ways, also through his recognizable presence. And uh, certainly, though, he comforts us uh, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, during this season, we've just uh, passed the Resurrection Sunday, and we celebrated the resurrection. And during this season of uh, recognizing what the Lord did on Calvary, we also, we, we begin to wait for Pentecost, and Pentecost is just a, a few weeks away, and I'm excited about Pentecost, and just put a commercial out there for a moment. Uh, this year on Pentecost, that's going to be our celebrating our heritage service, so I would encourage you to be in prayer about that, and, and I believe we're praying for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday. And every individual that hasn't experienced Pentecost, we pray that they would experience a baptism of the Holy Ghost evidence with speaking in other tongues. But this, uh, this season, it gives us the opportunity to reflect on the power and also the presence of the resurrection that is in our own lives. And the source of that power, the source is the promise to comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost really it is a loving a comforter, and it is a faithful comforter. I'm also thankful that the, the Holy Ghost, the comforter, is an un, unwavering comforter. It's a wise comforter. It's a comforter that will never leave you nor, nor forsake you. So the comforter, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost, it's an ever-present help in times of trouble. And I'm also thankful that the Holy Ghost, the comforter, it's an active comforter. It's not just going to sit by when you go through trials and tribulation, but the Lord is going to be active in your situation, and I believe that he's already been active here tonight. So the source of that is the Holy Ghost. But shortly before Christ's death and his resurrection, he emphasized to his disciples that the Holy Ghost should come after he had left. Furthermore, he said that the Holy Ghost would be himself in another form in spirit rather than in the flesh. Let's consider John chapter 14 before he went to Calvary. He was encouraging the disciples and he said this in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. 
ye believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'm so thankful for that promise. I'm thankful for the promise of his return, and again, for the body of Christ. That's not something that we should be afraid of. It's something that we should rejoice about. His return is near. His redemption draweth nigh. He said, I will come again and receive you unto my myself. And again, I think that's a very key. The Lord was saying, I'm going to receive you to myself. And I'm thankful to know that God is one, that Jesus Christ is a God almighty. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see another one, but we're going to see Jesus Christ in his glorified body. He said, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Skipping to verse 16, he said this in And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Someone say comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. And then he said something very profound. He said, but you know him. You already know the comforter. You know your helper. You know the advocate. I've been with you all this time. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He was revealing right there who he was. He was the mighty God in Christ. He was the word of God that was made of flesh. And they beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Then he goes on to say in this in verse number 18, he said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. Verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comforter, somebody say comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And then he said this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. He didn't say he was going to give anyone else's peace. He wasn't going to give somebody else's peace, but he was going to give us his peace. And not as a world giveth, give I unto you. And then he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm so thankful for the promise of the word of God that we shall have a comforter. And if you've ever been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you have the comforter not only dwelling with you, you, but he is in you. I think we should just pause and thank the Lord for the comfort uh, that he just demonstrated. Oh, some of you, you just received some strength in your body to carry on another day. I think we should thank God for the comfort that we feel. (laughs) Hallelujah. The comfort of the Holy Ghost. So the wonderful comfort of being filled with the Spirit is that we have access to the unlimited power of God. When we are filled with the Spirit, the potential for peace and joy, guidance and insight, calm and comfort have no bounds. In other words, it has no limitations. And I'm thankful for the presence of God that we even feel here tonight. Recorded in... Paul's epistle to the Ephesians is recorded two powerful prayers of the church. And I didn't put the prayer in its entirety in this Bible study just to save time, but I would encourage you to read back through those prayers. They're, they're very powerful prayers. And I believe if we pray these prayers, God will give us greater understanding and revelation of the mighty power that resonates within us, which is uh, the Holy Ghost. I'm going to have Reverend Kittle stand and read Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. And this is Paul's a prayer for spiritual wisdom. You see, the Holy Ghost, it brings spiritual wisdom, guidance, and reassurance to our life. Verse number 17. Thank you. 
a powerful prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the church. He was praying that their understanding would be opened up, their hearts would be enlightened, that we would understand the working of his mighty power in and through our life. He goes on to record another prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to have Reverend Cavasso stand and read this prayer that's identified in chapter 3. And this is a, the Apostle Paul's spiritual prayer for spiritual growth. And when we have a desire to grow in understanding, and when we grow in revelation, I also believe we begin to grow spiritually so that God can use us according to his will and purpose. Verse number 16, it begins that, that prayer. Amen. He's praying about the unlimited power that we have access to. The mighty power that works in a born-again believer is indeed the Spirit of God. It is the comforter that fills us with all joy and all peace. It strengthens us on the inner man. It fills us with an abounding hope. The Holy Ghost is also the glorious power that will resurrect us at the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul, he, he had a keen understanding of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He even references that he spoke in tongues more than, than all of the individuals and all of the churches, but he also understand that the power of the resurrection, the power of the Spirit, it was a necessity to the born-again believer, and that's why he continues to write in Romans chapter number 8, verse number 9, he said, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Oh, I'm so thankful that one day I came to an altar. I repented of my sins. I was baptized in the wonderful saving name of Jesus Christ. And God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hear me, one of the comforts of the Holy Ghost is a reassurance that when God comes back, you're going to be raptured out of this world. That's one of the comforts of the Holy Ghost. Are you thankful for that comfort? To know that you're saved. To know without a shadow of a doubt that God is in you. The hope of glory is in you. Oh, that's the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So the greatest comfort that the Holy Ghost brings, it is the guarantee, somebody say guarantee, of our future inheritance in Christ. Redemption becomes complete to those who are filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Ghost is our comfort and it's our reassurance that our inheritance is, is safe in a place prepared for us by Jesus. The Apostle Paul described it like this in Ephesians chapter number one. I'm going to have Reverend Louis Gonzalez stand and read Ephesians chapter one. Paul references that promise in this first epistle. Salvation, 
just going to pause there. He's writing to the church and the saints that are at Ephesus. And he's saying, after you received the word of truth, after you received the gospel message, after you believed it, you were sealed with something. You were sealed with that promise that was spoken of long ago. And that is the gospel of our salvation. Continue. <clears throat> Praise God. We're talking about the comfort of the Holy Ghost. The word earnest here, it means a pledge or an assurance. An assurance. A seal in biblical times as today is used to guarantee security, but also to indicate ownership. When God fills us with the Holy Ghost, he not only seals us, gives us a guarantee, but it also places his ownership in our life. Ancient seals were often made of wax, and they were embedded with a personalized imprint of the guarantee. So in both the Old and the New Testament, the significance of the act of sealing was dependent on the authority of the one doing the sealing. The seal would authenticate the guarantor's ability to make good on that which was promised within the sealed document. In this case, the promise of the believer's salvation and the future inheritance, it's been sealed with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you've ever received the Holy Ghost evidence with speaking in other tongues, God has sealed your inheritance for a future return. Praise God. Oh, I think we should thank God for that. That's a comfort. Talking about the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Here's a key understanding. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is both a seal of God's ownership of our lives and a guarantee that someday we will enjoy the fullness of heaven's blessing. When a person is baptized in the Spirit, they become part of God's spiritual family. Let us consider Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to read verse 13 and 14 out of the New Living Translation. It renders that verse this way. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Notice that there was indeed a belief in Jesus Christ, but it takes more than just a believing in God. You see, faith without works is dead. And I know we're saved by grace and not of works, but if you will show me your faith, I will show you also the works of God in your life. Verse 14, he goes on to say, the Spirit is God's uh, uh, guarantee. Somebody shall guarantee, guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Oh, I feel just a pause again, and I feel we should praise him and just glorify him for a moment to, this is not for me. This is for the one that died on Calvary so that you could receive the comforter, the help, your advocate. Oh, the one who is named Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of, of Peace. He did this so we could praise and glorify him. That's why I do not believe it was an accident when we begin to walk around the sanctuary and begin to exalt and praise him and glorify him that God's presence inhabited the sanctuary because his presence inhabits the praise of his people. But this was a promise that was promised long ago. You see, Joel, he prophesied about the giving of the Holy Ghost in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. 
And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days, uh, I will pour out my spirit. Joel prophesied about it. Ezekiel even prophesied about it. He prophesied about the effects that it would have on the heart of man. Isaiah prophesied about its effect upon the tongue. Isaiah 28, verse number 10. I'm going to have Brother Anthony Gonzalez stand and, and read that for us. The prophecy of Isaiah in verse number 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For this, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Oh, I'm thankful for the refreshing of the Holy Ghost. Earlier, I don't know about you, but I felt refreshed in my spirit. That's why I believe as Holy Ghost filled believers, every day we should pray in the Holy Ghost. It's the renewal. It's the refreshing of the Holy Ghost. And if you truly are thirsty of that refreshing, on that great day, that, that day of the feast that Jesus, he shouted out. He said, if any man thirsts and if he will come after me, I, I'm going to give him a drink. And whoever believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, when you have a refreshing in your spirit, it's going to overflow in your life. But it's not only going to affect your life, it's going to affect your children. Oh, I was thankful to look down here and see the parents uh, that were praying with their children. Uh, you know what you were doing? Uh, you were letting that river flow and begin to touch your children. We need that in this hour. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So thankful for our youth. Y'all did a tremendous job singing that song, Pastors Sanctified Proud. You ushered the presence of God into the sanctuary never lose that thirst never lose that hunger never lose that desire if you always have that desire god will refresh you and renew you so how did the apostle paul again when he wrote that letter to the ephesians how did the apostle paul know that the disciples of ephesus received the holy ghost and here's how he understood and knew paul distinctly and definitively heard them speak in other tongues. So let us consider the account in Acts chapter 19, verse number 1 through 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, he came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? This is a wonderful question to ask a believer. Believers that truly love God, they serve God, they go to church every week. And maybe some of them are even more faithful to the house of God than, than apostolics. They love God, they serve God with everything they know how to. But this is a wonderful question to ask them. Since you believe, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, then unto what? baptism were you baptized and they said unto john's baptism and then said paul john barely baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on christ jesus and when they heard this they heard the gospel of salvation they heard the truth when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were not baptized in the title, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but they were baptized in the one that died for them on the cross. They were baptized in the name that is above every other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Oh, I'm thankful to know that truth. Are you thankful to know that truth? Put your hands together and praise and glorify God. Praise God. 
They were baptized after they heard the word of truth. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, after they were baptized, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here's an important note. These were disciples in Ephesus. When Paul wrote his letter to the church of Ephesus, he confirmed their experience of receiving the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking in other tongues. Additionally, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, Paul affirmed that the Holy Ghost is the evidence. It is the assurance. It is the earnest. It is the guarantee of our eternal inheritance. In other words, it's a seal of our salvation. Within the last hundred years, a keen interest has arisen in the ever-widening circles of Christianity about the subject, but also the experience of being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Almost all denominations will study the baptism of the Holy Ghost, discuss it, and often argue the subject. But we've got to a place in history that denominations cannot deny it any longer. They may try to reason it away. They may say that it's not a necessity. But as an apostolic believer, we must never fall into the false doctrine that it's not an essential element of our salvation. We must be baptized with the Holy Ghost evidence with speaking in other tongues. Oh, come on, church. Our community needs to hear that. God has given you the truth. He's entrusted you with the truth. And we need to share the gospel. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. He's entrusted us with that truth. We're talking about the comfort of the Holy Ghost. However, it's undeniable and even agreeable or acceptable that it is essential to have the Spirit to make it to heaven. You see, denominations, they agree that it's essential to have the Spirit of God. It's undeniable. For the Apostle Paul in Romans said, if the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, you will not be resurrected. You're none of His. Thus, it's imperative to understand the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. Thankfully, we can have the Comforter. We can have the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost teaches us and reassures us of our salvation. Let us take a closer look at the gospel message that was delivered on the day of Pentecost. The gospel message of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It, it was a response into what happened earlier that day on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Ghost was poured out upon them that believed. And the apostle Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. But in Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, we see the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there was a commotion. Suddenly, there was an interruption. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house uh, where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, there, there was a move of the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They all began to speak with other tongues. And it was an utterance that, that the Spirit directed. What is an utterance? An utterance is a spoken word. It is not silent, but it is a statement or a definition could be a vocal sound. Why is it this important? Because the evidence of tongues, and this is where I pray that maybe fresh revelation will come. The evidence of tongues is definitive. Somebody say definitive. definitive. It's definitive evidence of receiving the promise of the comforter. The one that Jesus said he would send in his name, which is the Holy Ghost. A definitive example is the perfect example because it is both a verifiable and it is indisputable. Other evidence is subjective in nature because it is abstract. Consider the fruit of the Spirit. 
I'm so thankful that God loves us enough that he's not going to leave you to guess if you've been born again. But God's going to give you some evidence or a reassurance that guarantees your salvation. You see, consider the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, really, it is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of the Holy Ghost, but it's not the only evidence. It's a, it's a part of the Holy Ghost. It's an attribute of the Holy Ghost, but it's not the initial evidence. Considering the fruit of the Spirit outside the core element, which is God. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance are subjective. What does that mean? That means that you and I could define them different ways. If I were to ask you what peace is to you, you may give a completely different definition of peace than I would. If you consider patience or long-suffering, you know, Bishop may say that Brother Gonzalez is patient. I may look at Brother Gonzalez and say, you know what, he's not very patient. Why? Because that is a subjective. So the fruit of the Spirit is not the only evidence of the Holy Ghost. The initial evidence is something that is definitive, that cannot be disputed. It is verifiable. It is absolute. It is complete. And the evidence of that is speaking in another tongue as the Spirit gives the utterance. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This means the personal perspective. When you consider something being subjective, it means that personal perspective or preferences of a person are subject to who's observing something. In other words, some may be thinking here tonight, this is a long Bible study. I know JJ's thinking that. (laughs) He always asks me how many pages I have. He thinks this is a long, if I get to six pages, he thinks that's a long Bible study. But others think maybe this is maybe going by pretty quick. It's a short Bible study. You see, that is subjective. But all of us would agree here tonight that I've delivered this the best I can in the English language. Could we all agree on that? Guess what? When somebody is filled with the Holy Ghost, you cannot deny when the Spirit of God takes over and they begin to speak in another tongue as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. Oh, I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost. Oh, I think we should praise and glorify God. If you've ever been been baptized in the Holy Ghost, Give God some praise and glorify his name. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm thankful to be apostolic. We got a job to do. We must share it with our community. So what is definitive it? means this, a definition is definite, complete, final, or absolute. The Cambridge English Dictionary defines definitive as an example that is not able to be changed or improved. Speaking in tongues is a universal sign that is absolute and verifiable. Regardless of an individual's nationality, regardless of whether they speak Spanish, habla en espanol, or whether they are from a different location or a different country. They can recognize speaking in tongues when it happens to them. This provides the comfort. Somebody say comfort. And the certainty about one's experience with God. I'm thankful that God loved us enough And hear me, there's many denominational people, they're challenged with the reality of their salvation. They're challenged with that. But God loved us enough to to let you and I know we don't have to guess whether we're making it to heaven. If you've repented of your sins, been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, you are sealed with a promise. So the Lord provides a comfort and a certainty about our experience. Consider Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul, many believe, wrote this. The Apostle Paul writing said, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor 
forsake thee. Uh, again, you're, you're going to face trouble, disciples. I, I'm going to be taken away from you. But don't worry. I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, there you, may you be also. He said, but I'm going to send you a comforter. Uh, that word is paraclete. It could also be translated as a helper. Verse number six, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So here's a key understanding. The spirit of the Lord is our helper. The Greek word translated as helper is the same word that was translated in John chapter 14 as comforter. So we could rightfully say the Lord is our comforter. He's not only our help, but he is our advocate. Uh, he can be your doctor in the hospital room, and he can be your lawyer in the courtroom. Oh, hallelujah. I'm talking about the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Turn to somebody and say, this is the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So literally, the Greek word paraclete, it means this. Someone who is called to come along someone else. In Greek culture, a paraclete was like a family attorney or an advocate. So a paraclete was someone who came alongside people and defended them and protected them in times of trouble. A paraclete was someone who came alongside the weak to give them strength on the inner man and give them boldness and give them courage to face another day. So especially in the context of being persecuted, this is why some older translations are getting at when they translate paraclete as comforter. But Paul goes on to write this. After he said, the Lord is our comforter, the Lord is our helper. He wrote this in verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow." considering the end of their conversation. In other words, you need to consider their lifestyle. You need to consider their example. You need to consider the fruit of the Spirit that is in their life. And again, those are attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And he said, I want you to look at their, their life and their conversation. And I want you to hold fast to what they have taught you. And then he said something very fascinating. He said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Oh, Bishop, you preach a wonderful message on Sunday. Today is a day of salvation. Oh, and I'm thankful that the message we heard on Sunday was the same message they delivered on the day of Pentecost. The same way you get to heaven back then is the same way you get to heaven today. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. So here's a key point. If the evidence of the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, and if the evidence of the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues then. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is still speaking in tongues today because Jesus never changes. Are you thankful for the gospel message? Our community needs to hear it. Brother, Reverend Andrew Brown's going to stand, read Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. And this was a message that was delivered on Pentecost. It's the same today. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Could we quote that together? Then Peter said,
for the promise I don't know about you but that excites me there's a revival that is coming and he's going to use the apostolic church to reach our community oh I think we should lift up our hands and say, God, grant it. You have the truth. You have the word of God in you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Will we stand to our feet? Could you lift up your hands? Could you pray for our community? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ah, Put down your Bible study, lift up your hands, lift up your voice. Could we pray and ask God to let the Holy Ghost course through our life, course through our mind, course through our spirit. Yes, yes. If the Holy Ghost moves on you, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, let there be some intercession that breaks forth. Oh, ha ha. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. Oh, oh, hallelujah. If you want God to use you, when you get out of your seat, uh, would you come lift up your hands and say, God, use me in this hour. Thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. Uh, the power of God is in you. The Apostle Paul did not preach with enticing words uh, or the wisdom of man, but hear me, but in the demonstration or the evidence of the Spirit and the power of God. Oh, hallelujah. We need to pray and ask God to move among us in a mighty way. When you get down here, lift up your hands. Let the Spirit of God speak. Oh, the comfort of the Holy Ghost is here. Your helper is here. Uh, You can be healed in your body. You can be touched in your mind. Your children can be saved. For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are far off. As many as the Lord our God shall call. God is calling. If you don't have the Holy Ghost tonight, come up here. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you need to come up here. Today is the day of salvation. You can be rapture ready. Be renewed in the Holy Ghost. Everybody here should be renewed in the Holy Ghost tonight. Let that refreshing come.